Now, for those of you who are familiar with me, <laughs> you know that I am always authentic and quite transparent. So in keeping with that, let me explain why we are doing something quite different. I had someone suggest that we make available to everyone a copy of what you're going to receive in a few minutes from our wonderful ushers. What you will be receiving is a message written by our founder, Apostle Frederick Casey Price. Now, obviously, anything that I or anyone else for that matter <laughs> had prepared would pale in comparison to his extraordinary teaching. With that in mind, I decided to do what, and I'm gonna use a musical term, is called a mashup. In other words, I'm going to blend my message with the apostles. Now, let me be clear, and let's be real, okay? It's predominantly the apostles. <laughs> In doing so, though, I believe that you will definitely have a point of view that will prove interesting. Now, many of you have grown accustomed to receiving Minister Scott's amazing messages printed for your convenience to follow along while in service and most importantly, to take home for further study. Now, I am grateful to have this printed message written by the apostle to hand out to you today. However, I really want you to listen and follow along with this lesson, opposed to trying to read what you're being given because it's not gonna be exactly the same. So basically, you're gonna be, it's gonna be somewhat fruitless, okay? Consider this printed material that you're about to receive as a gift that you can truly grow from, as well as help others. Now, for those of you who plan on, because you know I'm being authentic, putting it in your circular file or trash, because you really just don't feel as if you have the time to read or study it further, I have something that I want you to meditate on. And you can turn with me to the scriptures and turn to Ecclesiastes, the seventh chapter and the 12th verse. Ecclesiastes 7, 12. I'm gonna share it with you out of the Amplified Classic Edition. And it says, for wisdom is a defense, even as money is a defense. But the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom shields and preserves the life of him who has it. So it's wonderful to have money, but wisdom trumps that. No pun intended whatsoever. As always, gleaning wisdom is your choice. Now, ushers, please be so kind as to pass out that gift to everyone. And as he's doing that, you can still listen, I'm sure. The title of this message is, What's It All About? Meaning we've all gathered here for Resurrection Sunday, and we all know that it's so exciting that Jesus is alive. But... Somewhere in the translation for many of us, it kind of gets watered down. Like really, what's it all about? Okay, he's alive, that's good, we appreciate it, that's great, but there's gotta be a little bit more to it. Well, you came to the right place today because we're gonna clarify some things, we're gonna make some things just, I think, extra, extra, extra special for you. And I really believe you're gonna leave with a different point of view. The celebration of Resurrection Day definitely keeps us in remembrance of the most important day that changed the history of the world. Resurrection Day, or Easter Sunday, is the day we traditionally celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I believe it is to be the most important day on the Christian calendar because everything in Christianity hinges on the reality of the resurrection. If the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is not a literal fact, then Christianity is nothing other than one of the great religions of the world. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, and we're gonna look at verses 20 through 22, and I'm gonna share it with you 
out of the Message Bible. I'm going to be using the Message Bible quite a bit today. So if you have that translation on your smartphone, you might want to just kind of keep it there. So starting with the 20th verse of 1 Corinthians 15, it says, but the truth is that Christ has been raised up, the first in a long legacy of those who are going to leave the cemeteries. This is a nice symmetry. There is a nice symmetry in this. Death initially came by a man, and resurrection from death came by a man. Everybody dies in Adam. Everybody comes alive in Christ. Jesus himself, when he appeared in a vision to John on the Isle of Patmos, he said this. He made this definite declaration, and we're all probably very familiar with it. You can find it in Revelation, the first chapter, and verse 8. And I'm going to share it out of the Amplified because the Amplified gives us qualifiers. So it's very, very clear, and that's what I really appreciate about it. So Revelation 1, verse 8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God, who is, here's the qualifier, existing forever, and who was, the other qualifier, continually existing in the past, and who is to come, the Almighty, the Omnipotent, the ruler of all. Traditionally, most denominations have accepted and followed the idea that Jesus died on Friday. How many have heard that? Okay, Good Friday was the day that he died, right? I mean, I've heard that since I was a child. Okay, well, this and many other beliefs surrounding the event known as Easter are inaccurate and unscriptural, even though they have been accepted by most traditional churches. I believe that Christians ought to know the truth and the fact that the resurrection of Jesus Christ does not have a thing to do with chocolate-covered rabbits and other such trappings. Now, let me be clear. If you choose to give your children candy, etc., make sure that you tell them about Jesus and his love for them. Do not let them think that some bunny rabbit brought them gifts and candy. And if you do, I want you to think about this. If you do that and you do not tell them about Jesus, you are helping Satan. And more importantly, you are setting them up to fail in life. Now that is a really profound statement. Why do I say this? Here's why. Because A, you're lying to them, flat out, okay? And B, you're ignoring their spirit and you're feeding their flesh. And on top of that, you're feeding their flesh with lots of sugar, which is more addictive than cocaine. That's a fact, okay? Now, do not misunderstand me. I, along with my children and grandchildren, appreciate candy, especially chocolate, okay? <laughs> However, we understand that it must be consumed in moderation, and more importantly, we all know the importance of Resurrection Day. Another trapping of the enemy is people feel as if they have to get great new clothes for Easter. I mean, I grew up in a Baptist church, I'm telling you now. People started looking two months before Easter because we had to go get our Easter shoes and our Easter clothes and our Easter hat. Did anybody else go through that? Okay, so I'm not the only one, right? Okay, but you know what I never understood? Why? What does that have to do with celebrating Jesus? What does that have to do with him being alive? What does it have to do with any of that? Why do we do it? This is what I want this lesson to do, to make us really stop and think so that if you choose to go out and buy something new, it's because you choose to do it. Don't do it for Easter. I mean, really. I mean, I actually know parents who have gone into debt to get clothes for their children for Easter. And the sad part is sometimes they don't even bring their children to church unless it is Easter. And listen, you can, this isn't something I'm making up. You could turn on the TV for the last month and there are commercials all over the place where you're supposed to go to. I'm not going to give names to people because I'm not going to give them any more play. But the point is, they're telling you to come to their store so that you can get Easter clothes for the whole family. I mean, really? I mean, 
Any channel you turn to, it doesn't matter. They're doing this. So what is that? What is that telling you? It is yet another trick of the enemy to take money out of your pocket. It's not building the kingdom of God. It is not lifting up the name of Jesus. It's doing nothing but lining their pockets. Something to think about, okay? Now, we know that at a certain point in history, Jesus walked the earth. Everybody can agree with that. He was God manifested in the flesh, the invisible God who came down into the realm of visibility so that man could see him. Jesus said repeatedly throughout his ministry, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. In other words, I am God manifested in the flesh so you can see and comprehend what God is all about. If you were looking for the Father, look at me. Satan thought he could destroy Christianity by destroying Jesus. <laughs> and that is the reason he put the idea of betraying Jesus to the, into the heart of the Pharisees into one of Jesus' own men, Judas Iscariot. We all know that story. Then the Roman government, acting on false charges against Jesus, did what? They killed him. Now, here's the key. After the crucifixion, the devil realized that persecution could not stop Christians. The more he persecuted us, the more we grew. The more he put pressure on us, the bolder we got. And the more he tried to stop us, the louder we preached. So he decided on another tactic, to water down and compromise Christianity. Satan had an open vessel in one of the great emperors of antiquity, Constantine, who made an edict or a sovereign decree establishing Christianity as the state religion. Now, because of this decree, it be suddenly became fashionable to be a Christian. Okay, I'm gonna pause here. There are people who only show up to church on Easter, uh, some will even tell you they'll go maybe to a wedding or it's specific times. Why do they do that? Because it's fashionable. It's something that is expected of them in society. It's not because it's tied to their heartstrings. It's not because it's something that they want to do. You've heard me say before, and you've heard other people say it, not just me, there is nothing new under the sun. So the same thing that we see happening in that instance, it happened back then. And that's exactly the tactic that the enemy was using. Government leaders, soldiers, and many, other, be, be, many others began to come into the church. The church leaders of the day, desiring to make the people happy, began to compromise the pure doctrines of Jesus and his apostles. And I submit to you that same thing is happening today, where people are just running into church because that's what you're supposed to do. Like, I know, for instance, okay, my family is from the South. I have an aunt that if you go to visit her, she will tell you flat out, and this is terrible, I'm not proud of this, but we all have family members that you know. <laughs> I'm authentic with you, so I tell you everything. Anyway, if you go to see my Aunt Sophie, she will tell you flat out, you could have hung out in the club all night long, the night before, but if you are in her area, you're gonna get up and go to church. And I always, as a child, would see this, and I'm like, okay, but, we're supposed to go to church because we're worshiping the Lord. And if I'm in a club hanging out all night the night before, why are you making me do it? It's, it wasn't, in other words, it was just the thing to do. It was the fashionable thing. It was the thing that nobody in the, in the neighborhood would talk about that, you know, this family wasn't in church on Sunday. See, we've got to get past that. We've got to get real. We are living in a time where we can no longer play church and play doing what we think is familiar. And we can no longer sit and not have a true understanding of what we believe, why we believe it, and what we do. As you hear me in every opening prayer before I speak, I thank the Lord for the time that you have given. Because in the time that you've given, you've deposited a part of your life to be able to hear the word of God. Because think about it. Whatever time we just spent five minutes ago, I don't care how much money you have, you can't get that five minutes back again. It is gone forever, which means you gave that much of your life to be here. So therefore, we've got to understand 
why we do what we do, and be purposeful in our living. Now, that was just a sidebar, but anyway. This is how the word Easter got into Christianity. Notice we say that we're celebrating Resurrection Day. We're not celebrating Easter. Okay, that goes along with, you know, the bunny rabbits and all the rest of that. That's cute, but that's not what we are basing our life upon. We're basing a life upon the fact that he lives. This we celebrate, Resurrection Day. So the word Easter, <laughs> interestingly enough, is not found in the Bible at all. You can't find it in there. In Acts 12, the 12th chapter of Acts, the fourth verse, the word that is translated Easter in the King James actual translation is the Greek word Pasha, meaning Passover. It does not mean Easter. The word Easter comes from Astarte, the goddess of fertility. Now, just you can really stop sometimes and almost become amused at how certain things are symbolic of other things and why they choose certain things. Why do you think they associate, since they chose to come up with the word Easter from this goddess of fertility, okay? They had to choose some kind of character to go along with that. So what did they choose? A bunny rabbit. Why did they choose a bunny rabbit? Because rabbits are symbolic of fertility because they are prolific reproducers. In other words, they have babies on a continuous basis all the time, anywhere, anytime. That's why they chose a bunny rabbit. And we as believers don't take the time to study this, break it down, figure it out. We just go along with the flow. And how many of you, and I've done it in the past too. So I mean, you know, we have given our kids all these little bunny rabbits. Now I will say, I did always tell my children about Jesus, so I'm blessed with that. But the point is, there are a lot of children right now who have no idea what Easter is about, except for the candy, the baskets, and the gifts. And now it's gotten to a point where they think they're supposed to get big time gifts, not just the little basket of candy. They actually want gifts. They're asking for sneakers and iPads and all kinds of things. But why are they doing it? They have no idea, and their parents are not telling them. Now, spring is a time when the earth is coming back to life from winter, when the greenery is coming forth, and many pagan rituals were celebrated in that time frame. And these pagan rituals and traditions were lumped together with the resurrection. Why? To water it down. It's all purposeful, okay? The resurrection is Christian, but Easter is not. Good Friday is supposed to be the day on which Jesus was crucified. Now let's just stop here. The day he was crucified, I remember when I was about seven years old, asking my mother, why would they call it Good Friday if they killed our Lord? What was good about that? That always bothered me. I mean, I could understand if you're going to tell me it happened on Friday, but what made it a good Friday? So they tried to explain it by saying, well, if he had not been crucified, then he would not have rose again, and then we would not celebrate all of the wonderful things we do as Christians. So I mean, I kind of bought that. I was like, okay, that kind of makes logical sense, maybe. But it's always kind of troubled me. Why do we call it Good Friday? Because I know full well that many people don't associate it the way I just explained it. But anyway, dear friends, there is no way that you can pull out, and this is key, three days and three nights from Friday night to Sunday morning. Now, Jesus said that he would be in the heart or the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. That's what he said. So we know that he only speaks the truth. So if that were the case, how could he have been crucified on Friday and then rose again on Sunday? It just, I mean, you can count on your fingers and toes. That's not three days and three nights. Still, okay, and you can give it to the most distinguished mathematician that you may find. They still cannot make three days and three nights happen from Friday to Sunday. But still, many Christians go along year after year following this fallacy and just keep the whole thing going. Now, the God we serve is always and always will be a God of accuracy. 
And Jesus Christ is not a party to confusion. Either he is, or either he was, or he was not in hell for three days and three nights. It, it's one or the other. And we ought to be able to find that out in scripture, correct? Turn with me to Matthew's gospel. And we're going to look at chapter 27, verses 62 through 66. And I'm going to share it with you out of the Amplified translation. Okay? Matthew 27 Verses 62 through 66 in the Amplified says this. The next day, that is, the day after the day of preparation for the Sabbath, the chief priests and the Pharisees assembled before Pilate and said, Sir, we have remembered that when he, meaning Jesus, was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise from the dead. Therefore, Give orders to have the tomb made secure and safeguarded until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last deception, the reporting of his resurrection, will be worse than the first, the reporting that he is the Messiah. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Go with them. Make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure. And along with stationing a guard of soldiers to be on watch, they set a seal on the stone. These chief priests and Pharisees were Jesus's detractors. They were opposed to his ministry. Yet out of their own mouths, they repeated what they had heard Jesus Jesus Christ himself actually say. Now, there are two terms which really need to be clarified, resurrection and raised from the dead. You see, it's one thing to be raised from the dead and quite another thing to be resurrected. Turn with me to John's Gospel, the 11th chapter, and we're going to look at verses 25 and 26. John's Gospel, the 11th chapter, verses 25 and 26. If we look at it in the New King James Version, which is the version most people have, it says, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Now, the Amplified puts it this way. I am the resurrection and the life whoever believes in. And see, this is why I like the Amplified because here is the qualifier. This, what, this is what it means to believe. Adheres to, trusts in, relies on me as savior. That's the other qualifier. See, it's one thing to believe in Jesus as someone who is the son of God, who's written about in the Bible, in a book, like a character. It's another thing where you adhere to, trust in, rely on him as your savior. That's a distinct difference, okay? So if you're doing the latter that I just mentioned, well, it says here that you will live even if you die. And everyone who lives and believes in me as savior will never die. Do you believe this? Now here's something interesting. He is clearly talking about what kind of death? It has to be spiritual death and spiritual life. <sighs> if you believe in him, you are not going to physically die. Some people have misconstrued that Jesus said and have gone out teaching a doctrine that you're just not going to die. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible does not say that you are not going to die physically. And this is something we really got to spend a little time on. Turn with me to Hebrews, because Hebrews makes it clear. And it doesn't matter what translation. If you look at it in the New King James Version, it says, and it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. In the Amplified, with the qualifiers, it says, and just as it is appointed and destined for all men to die once, and after this comes certain judgment. Okay, so, how could Jesus be talking about physical death when he says, he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live? Paul died. 
Peter died. Stephen died. Jesus was talking about real death, which is spiritual. So what is the difference between being raised from the dead and the resurrection? That's a big question. Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead. We know that. But Lazarus, unfortunately, had to die again. And the widow of Nain's son, who was raised from the dead, had to die again as well. As Jairus' 12-year-old daughter, whom Jesus also raised from the dead. Resurrection, however, is when you cannot die anymore. Death has no more hold on you. Jesus is alive today because he was resurrected. Now turn with me to Romans. I want you to see this. Turn with me to Romans, the sixth chapter. We're going to look at verses 9 through 11, and I'm going to share it out of the message. Romans 6, starting with verse 9. Could it be any clearer? Our old way of life was nailed to the cross with Christ. A decisive end to that sin-miserable life, no longer at sin's every beck and call. What we believe is this. If we get included in Christ's sin-conquering death, we also get included in his life-saving resurrection. We know that when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was a signal of the end of death as the end. Never again will death have the last word. When Jesus died, he took sin down with him, but alive he brings God down to us. From now on, think of it this way. Sin speaks a dead language that means nothing to you. God speaks your mother tongue and you hang on every word. You are dead to sin and alive to God. That's what Jesus did. Now, I also want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians. Now, we touched on this in the beginning. But I really want to break this down. And the reason I want to break this down especially is because we have had a lot of family members within the past year or so who have transitioned. And I know it's left some question for people. And, you know, it's, I don't want you to be vague. I want you to be clear. In all things, I want you to be clear. So I want you to see this. Turn to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. We're going to spend a little minute in this chapter. So if we look at verses 22 through 28, and this is in the message, it says, and this whole thing that I'm going to read to you is coming out of the message, just so that you know. Okay, it says, there is a nice symmetry in this. Death initially came by a man, and resurrection from death came by a man. Everybody dies in Adam, everybody comes alive in Christ, like we said. But we have to wait our turn. You see, Christ is first. Then those with him at his coming, the grand consummation when, after crushing the opposition, he hands over his kingdom to God the Father. He won't let up until the last enemy is down and the very last enemy is death. As the psalmist said, he laid them low one and all. He walked all over them. When scripture says that he walked all over them, it's obvious that he couldn't at the same time be walked on. When everything and everyone is finally under God's rule, the son will step down, taking his place with everyone else, showing that God's rule is absolutely comprehensive, a perfect ending. Drop down to verse 35 in the same chapter. So this is 1 Corinthians 15. Just drop down to verse 35. Some skeptic is sure to ask, show me how resurrection works. Give me a diagram. Draw me a picture. What does this resurrection body look like? If you look at this question closely, you realize how absurd it is. There are no diagrams for this kind of thing. We do have a parallel experience, however, in gardening. You plant a dead seed. Now, I want you to really think about this. You know, we've all been in school at some point and got those little packages of seeds. You know, we wanted to plant tomatoes or marigolds or whatever it is. It's a dead-looking seed, right? Okay, back to the scripture. Soon after you plant that dead seed, there is a flourishing plant. 
There is no visual likeness between the seed and plant. You could never guess what a tomato would look like by looking at a tomato seed. What we plant in the soil and what grows out of it don't look anything alike. The dead body that we bury in the ground and the resurrection body that comes from it will be dramatically different. You will notice that the variety of bodies is stunning. Just as there are different kinds of seeds, there are different kinds of bodies. Humans, animals, birds, fish, each unprecedented in its form. You get a hint at the diversity of resurrection glory by looking at the diversity of bodies, not only on earth, but in the skies, the sun, moon, stars, all these varieties of beauty and brightness. And we're only looking at pre-resurrection seeds. Who can imagine what the resurrection plants will be like? This image of planting a dead seed and raising a live plant is a mere sketch at best. But perhaps it will help in approaching the mystery of the resurrection body. But only if you keep in mind that when we're raised, we're raised from good, we're raised for good, alive forever. The corpse that's planted is no beauty, but when it's raised, it's glorious. But in the ground weak, put in the ground weak, it comes up powerful. The seed sown is natural. The seed grown is supernatural. Same seed, same body. But what a difference from when it goes down in physical mortality to when it is raised up in spiritual immortality. Now just drop down to verse 54, and it says, but let me tell you something wonderful, a mystery I'll probably never fully understand. We're not all going to die, but we are all going to be changed. You hear a blast to end all blasts from a trumpet, and in that time that you look up and blink your eyes, it's over. On signal from that trumpet from heaven, the dead will be up and out of their graves, beyond the reach of death, never to die again. At the same moment and in the same way, we'll all be changed. In the, rex in the resurrection scheme of things, this has to happen. Everything perishable, taking off the shelves and replaced by the imperishable. This mortal replaced by the immortal. Then the saying will come true, death swallowed by triumphant life. Who got the last word? Oh, death, oh, death, who's afraid of you now? It was sin that made death so frightening and law code guilt that gave sin its leverage, its destructive power. But now, in a single victorious stroke of life, all three, sin, guilt, death, are gone. The gift of our master, Jesus Christ. Thank God, with all this going for us, my dear, dear friends, stand your ground and don't hold back. Throw yourselves into the work of the master, confident that nothing you do for him is a waste of time or effort. Now let's look closely at Jesus' statement, after three days, I will rise. Turn with me to Mark's Gospel, the 15th chapter, and we're going to look at verse 42. Mark's Gospel, the 15th chapter, verse 42. This I'm going to share with you out of the Amplified Classic Edition. And it says, as evening had already come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath. Now, I really need you to kind of pay attention to this, okay? Religion, religious tradition gets the idea that Jesus died on a Friday because verse 42, which we just read, says the day before the Sabbath. Okay, that's where they're getting it from. Now, to most people, the Sabbath is every Saturday. So the day before the Sabbath would be what? It would be Friday. However, Jesus very clearly said that the only sign he would give would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Preparation on Friday could not be possibly, it couldn't possibly be true because you cannot have the three days and three nights to Friday and still end up on Sunday as we discussed before. 
Now the other thing is, notice, it's very important that you notice the words preparation and Sabbath. Now I want you to turn to John's Gospel, the 19th chapter, and we're going to read verse 14. John's Gospel, the 19th chapter, verse 14. And I'm going to share it out of the Amplified Classic Edition again. And it says, Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. And it was about the sixth hour, which is about the twelfth hour or noon. He said to the Jews, See, here is your king. This is the key. Now, it was the preparation day of the Passover. Now, this is referring to the very same event that is recorded in Mark's gospel. Only in this last account that we just read, the Holy Spirit specified what Sabbath the preparation was for. It was not the preparation of the weekly Sabbath, but the preparation of the Passover Sabbath, which is distinctly different. Here's why. The Passover is a Sabbath day. In fact, the Jews had more than one Sabbath day, which has caused confusion. This is why you have to study things. You can't just take everything at face value because you don't get all of the truth behind it. All these days that were considered Sabbath were to serve the same purpose, to have the people rest. They were all to be called days of rest, but there were several different ones. Now, if you look in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, verses 1 and 2, it lets us know, and the Lord spoke to Moses in these verses, saying, verses 1 and 2, speaking, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, the feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. Notice the word feasts is plural. It's not just a feast. Look at verse 3 in the same chapter, Leviticus 23. It says, six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Please keep in mind that the above verses refer to what? The Saturday Sabbath. It is called a day of rest, a holy convocation. Now look at, just drop down, and we're going to continue with verses 4 through 7. And it says, these are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, we could say Sabbaths, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. On the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. On the first day, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. Okay, great. Now, what does all this mean? God is talking about the preparation day of the Passover or the first day of Passover. And he refers to it as a holy convocation or Sabbath. Now, the Passover was a shadow of the type of Jesus Christ. Jesus is our Passover lamb. He is our substitute. That is what the Passover lamb was to the children of Israel, their substitute. When the children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt, the Pharaoh would not let them depart, even though Moses brought him the edict or sovereign decree from God. God firmly said, I will permit the death angel to come to the house of Egypt as a sign of my wrath and judgment upon Egypt. Every firstborn child of every household will die because of Pharaoh's hardness of heart. However, in the houses of Goshen, where the children of Israel resided, God said, take a lamb, a male lamb of the first year without a spot, without a wrinkle, without a blemish, and kill it. They were instructed to take the blood from that lamb and paint it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of their houses. The lamb's body was to be split open, roasted with fire, and stretched out full length both ways. God said they were to follow his direction so that when the angel of death got to each individual house, he would see the blood and pass over that house, and no firstborn in that house would die. That is what the word Passover means. The death angel passed 
over. But what saved the people? It was the blood of the sacrificial lamb. What did John the Baptist say at the banks on the Jordan River when he looked up and saw Jesus? He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And you can document, document this, just write it down. John's Gospel, the first chapter, verse 29. Jesus is the Passover Lamb. His shed blood has saved us. Now God instructed the children of Israel to prepare the Passover Lamb on the 14th day of Nisan. Likewise, now the 14th day of Nisan, Nisan, just in case you want to know what that is, it's the seventh month of the Jewish calendar. Likewise, I submit to you that the 14th day of Nisan is the very same day of the year on which the Lord Jesus Christ died. Now the death of Jesus was to fulfill the Passover. In the year in which Jesus died, the 14th day of Nisan, when the lamb was supposed to be slain, was on a Wednesday not a Friday. Now let us count. You can use your fingers and toes. At sundown, at the end of the day, the Hebrew day, by the way, ended at 6 p.m. when night began. The Bible said they took his body down from the cross because they could not allow bodies to remain on the cross during that particular holy convocation or Sabbath. Why? Because it was the Passover. Here is the key. That was on a Wednesday night. Wednesday night was the first night in the grave and Thursday the first day. Thursday night was the second night in the grave and Friday was the second day. Friday night was the third night in the grave and Saturday was the third day. When the women came to the tomb, they had to wait for the weekly Sabbath to pass. The end of the Sabbath technically would be 6 a.m. Sunday morning. The Bible says that when the women came, it was not yet Sunday morning. Turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, the 28th chapter, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. Matthew 28. If you look at it in the New King James Version, it says, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Now, it gives us a little bit a little bit more clarity in the Amplified when it says, now after the Sabbath near dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And then, of course, it talks about the earthquake. And then the, their description of the guards, it says, the guards shook paralyzed with fear at the sight of him and became like dead men, pale and immobile. And then the message, I really like how they put it. They said, after the Sabbath, as the first light of the new week dawned, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to keep vigil at the tomb. Suddenly the earth reeled and rocked under their feet as God's angel came down from heaven, came right up to where they were standing. He rolled back the stone and they sat on it. Shafts of lightning blazed from him. His garment shimmered snow white. The guards at the tomb were scared to death. They were so frightened they couldn't move. <laughs> now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began, this is when the ladies went. We just said that. Okay, great. Here's the key. Jesus was already risen when they came, as the first day of the week began to dawn. Actually, Jesus rose from the dead somewhere between sundown Saturday and sunrise Sunday. Thus, there is no such thing biblically as Good Friday. Jesus did not die on Friday. He died on Wednesday, the 14th day of Nisan. He perfectly and accurately fulfilled the shadow and type according to the Old Testament or of the Passover lamb. He is our Passover lamb. When Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he rose triumphant over death hell and the grave. Now do you think 
that the punishment for our sin was for someone to simply die on the cross? I mean, do you really think about that? If that were so, then the two thieves crucified with Jesus could have paid the price. But they could not because the real punishment was to go into hell itself and serve our time separated from God. Jesus did that on our behalf. After divine justice was satisfied, God said, it is enough. Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to heaven. He is there now, alive and well. We serve a risen Savior. Praise God. Now, what makes this day so important to our day-to-day -day lives, you may ask? We are all trying our best to just make it through and to lead successful lives. We are definitely appreciative of what Jesus did for us. But if we had to explain what's this all about, what could we say? Plain and simple, Jesus gave us a gift that no one else could give. He allows us to have life and have it more abundantly. He literally saved us from the clutches of the enemy and all of his demons. He provided for us what we could never do for ourselves. And when I say never, I use that word with meaning. Because let me tell you something, I don't care, No, ma it doesn't matter how much money you make, it does not matter how many things you acquire or how much stuff you think you can get. It doesn't matter what your status, what, whatever status or position you hold, how many people you have on Facebook and social media that are supposedly your friends. No matter how influential you think you are, no matter how much education you may have, you still cannot do or get or earn what Jesus gave to us. Turn with me to Ephesians, the second chapter, and the ninth verse, Ephesians 2, 9, you've got to see this. Because not as a result of your works, all those things I just mentioned, nor your attempts to keep the law, so that no one will be able to boast or take credit in any way for his salvation. And I really like how the message puts it, because the message actually backs it up to verse 7 through 10, and it says, now God has us where he wants us with all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. Saving is all his idea and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and saving. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work he has gotten ready for us to do, work we had better be doing. The other thing, which I love, turn with me to 1 Peter, the second chapter and the ninth verse. 1 Peter 2, 9, I'm sure you're familiar with it. I'm going to share it out of the Amplify, and it says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a consecrated nation, a special people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies, the wonderful deeds and virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And if you look at it in the message, it says, but you are the ones chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments to do his work and speak out for him, to tell others of the night and day difference he made for you from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. That's what happened when Jesus went to the cross, but more importantly, when he kept his word and rose again. Because of the shed blood of Jesus and the fact that he is our risen king, we are given the privilege of becoming royalty 
in a kingdom, not of this world. You see, if you look at things from just the worldly perspective, you have to be born into royalty. You have to know somebody over in the pond or whatever, over the pond, so that you can, you know, or marry into the family or whatever. We don't have to go through any of that. And you know what's even better when you really stop to think about it? Because, you know, if you've ever traveled to Europe and you go over and you see the throne rooms and you see the castles, and all of that is beautiful and all of that is wonderful. But do you know what I like and what I do, and especially on days when you know you might be going through a challenge, you might be going through a time where you just feel like it is difficult, to, you don't even want to get out of bed. You know, I'm being authentic. Maybe none of you have had those days. But sometimes you can be really growing through something that's really got you. And you just don't even feel like getting up. You just want to put the covers over your head and say, I'm going to go back to sleep and start over another, another day. Well, on days when they come, every now and then, I do something. I get up, I go into my bathroom, I look in the mirror, and I realize, OK, I'm not living in a castle, per se, and I don't have servants here to do everything for me. You know, I still got to do all that. But you know what I can do? I can square my shoulders. I can look in that mirror and say, I am royalty because I am a daughter of the Most High God. And you know what? My Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, he is my intercessor. He is my high priest. And I am seated in heavenly places with them. So you know what? There is nothing at all that's going to make me feel anything but victorious because of whose I am. I can do that because he is alive. I can do that because he rose again. He made me royalty. Anybody who believes on him, you are royalty in a kingdom that's not of this world. And that is far greater than anything that this earth has to give you. So you stand tall in your royal priesthood. Jesus died and rose again so that you could do just that. He redeemed us from the curse of the law and the idiocy of Adam's act of treason. Jesus is unlike any man that you know. Do not make the mistake of bringing him down to your level, but rather adjust your thinking to his level. He will not ever disappoint you like other men that you know or may have known. It's not possible. You see, this is a man who allowed nails to be driven into his hands and his precious blood was shed so that you would never be broke another day in your life. Every need that you have is already met according to his riches and glory. He already provided that for you. As a believer, you are seated in heavenly places with him and all things, how many things are left out of all? Nothing, right? All things are beneath your feet. You are a joint heir with him and the most high God. How dare you? allow that Easter Bunny to get more attention. <laughs> now, as Christians, we are getting lulled into complacency. We are becoming desensitized regarding our own salvation. This is intended by the enemy. However, we cannot stand by and participate. What's it all about besides just becoming royalty? I'll tell you, peace of mind, that's something that you're given. Joy, no matter what life presents. We all have gone through challenges, and you know what? There are still storms to come, but we are victorious if we believe. That's something that we can stand upon. We have <laughs> true hope, even in times of trouble, and we have strength. The joy of the Lord is indeed our strength. Healing is part of our covenant right. And you know what? Walking in divine health, that's even better. 
Freedom. We have freedom over the worry of death. We don't have to be like the world. We have freedom when it comes to that. And we have the ability to forgive and truly walk in love. We also have deposited within us the fruits of the Spirit of God. We also have assurance that no one else can provide for us, even our parents, our spouse, or our friends. The power of the entire Godhead is within us. Victory in all things, if we believe, that's a fact. It's not a chance like playing a game, but rather it's a promise. We also have the Holy Spirit, our helper, comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby to guide us along our life path, just as Jesus promised us. Why is this celebration of Resurrection Day so important? It reminds us of two other paramount things. Because Jesus rose from the dead and is alive, turn with me to John's Gospel, the 16th chapter, verse 33. This is something that I share with you out of my favorite translation of them all, the Amplified Classic Edition, and it says, this is Jesus speaking to us. I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world you have tribulation and trials and distress and frustration. But be of good cheer, take courage, be confident, certain, undaunted, for I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered it for you. He is alive and he's done that for you. Oh my goodness, you gotta know that. You've gotta know that. Turn with me to Romans. The eighth chapter, and we all know this is one of my favorites. Romans 8, verses 37 through 39, but I really like it out of this translation, the message, and it says this. So what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything else he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? And who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? Who would dare even to point a finger? The one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment st sticking up for us. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in scripture. They kill us in cold blood because they hate you. We're sitting ducks. They pick us off one by one. None of this phases us because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way. That Thanks Jesus, for joining us. Our, our hope is that you received something that you can apply to your life and strengthen Moving your faith. At Crenshaw Christian Whenever Center, New York, we believe that the Word of God is practical for everyday application. You if you'd like to support the ministry with your tithe and offering, you can of mail them to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 457 Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, you know New York, 10123. We yeah. also offer the convenience oh. of mobile and online giving. It's safe and secure. Try it now. From your smartphone, simply text East G to 28950 and follow the prompts. You can even specify a designation for your gift. Text East G for general donation, East T for tithe, 
East O for offering or East AL to donate to the Apostles Library. Each transaction needs to be its own individual text message. You can also visit our website, CrenshawChristianCenterEast.org and click the Give tab to begin your experience. Set up recurring donations or give one-time gifts. This giving method is easy to use, safe and secure, and requires a one-time registration only. After your first gift, giving will be completely simple. Simply text East G to 28950 with your information securely stored. We appreciate your continued support and stand in agreement with you for the manifold return on your life. Thanks again for watching. And remember, we walk by faith, not by sight. We would like you, our viewers and partners, to join us in honoring the legacy of the Apostle by making a donation to the Apostle Frederick K.C. Price Library. The library will be on the grounds of the Faith Dome in Los Angeles, California, and it will be open to the public. It will be a place of study, learning, and research, available for anyone desiring to further their knowledge and understanding of the Christian faith. Visitors will also have a chance to learn more about our founder and his impact on the body of Christ and the world at large. You can mail your donations to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. If you are giving by check, be sure to designate in the memo area, Apostles Library. If you have Crenshaw Christian Center envelopes, you can mark AL on the envelope. You can also donate via your smartphone by texting East AL to 28950 and follow the prompts. We thank you in advance for your support. And as always, we stand in agreement for the manifold return in your life.